here's a little bit. This will be specifically targeted to uh, discussing DNA sequencing, so a very specific application of biosciences. But one that's uh, biosensors, this is an application that's been really changing a lot in the last 10, 20 years after that first human genome project that, that took over 10 years. And so I wanted to give a little bit of highlights about of where uh, people are, or what, um, what applications they're seeing for the being able to do much more lower cost rapid DNA sequencing, some of the techniques behind that, and then how integrated biophotonics is revolutionizing this whole industry. So here are some recent research papers. Um, Nature publishes a lot, um, but you can see the idea is here to read those four basic nucleotides that compose the DNA that every uh, living cell has. This is the instruction sets to build the proteins that build the, the species. And uh, a lot of times in biology class, you'll learn that, okay, there's a certain set of, of um, a string of these bases that compose one gene. I always ask, what's a gene? Well, it's a, some length of of uh, these monomers that build up uh, that are the instruction set for the, for the protein. But as biologists have find more tools or, or more advanced tools to understand the genome, the, actually the definition of what's going on in the DNA is changing quite a bit. And it's not only for humans. You will see the, the picture of the durian for, for the local Malaysians when always sees the signs in the hotel, no durian fruit. And this was recently sequenced, and you may say, okay, well, what's so interesting about the durian fruit? Well, that, that very frequent smell that um, prohibits most hotel uh, guests from bringing it into their room is um, actually kind of interesting from a scientific standpoint, because what is it in the DNA that's allowing this fruit to make so much of that fragrant smell? And, and, and you think, okay, well, that's interesting, but a lot of the uh, medicines that we use come from plants. And this plant is able to make a lot of this particular aroma. So maybe if we understand the part of the genome that's making so much of this, not where in the DNA the protein or the aroma is made, but the instructions to make a lot of it, we can make plants that will make a lot of the medicines that we need for our health care. Um, and this very uh, f um, photogenic animal here at the bottom, the axle, um, is an interesting little salamander that lives in Mexico. It has a very interesting property that it's a, it's a salamander, so it, um, like a frog that goes through metamorphosis, it becomes a tadpole to a frog and it lives out on the land. This creature lives only in water and, and never really matures, but it's able to regenerate not only its limbs, so uh, if it loses a, a limb, it can regrow the, all the, the little fingers and everything, but it also can regrow the spine, which is interesting um, as well. What is, what is the properties, or what are the properties of the DNA that allows this to, um, creature to, to regrow so much of its body functions? And so when we're talking about DNA sequencing, we're talking about reading or looking up those different bases. And the picture there on the, on the bottom right is a picture of one of our trays. So there are four chips in there. Uh, we call them cells, but uh, four devices. And on each device, um, you can uh, place your DNA sample, and it will read out what these sequences are. Now, the human genome is about uh, 3 billion bases long, so you don't necessarily always want to read out the whole entire sequence. People have been doing what they call DNA sequencing for a while. We heard about the single nucleotide polymorphism, the SNPs, um, that look at uh, very specific regions. There's the talk, talk about d looking at for specific genes or the exomes. Um, but what's happening as the technology has been changing and advancing is that we've been able to look at more uh, longer sec sections of the of the gene of the DNA, and specifically, I wanted to give some examples of the structural vari variants, or um, and how that's playing into understanding how DNA is contributing to diseases. And in order to see these structural variations, we need to be able to have very long sequences. So, by structural variants, we mean where parts of the DNA, of the genome, the whole genome, maybe parts are missing 
or it's in, it somehow gets inserted in a different part of, the, of a chromosome, it's duplicated. There are many different types. And um, some of you may be familiar with having, uh, if you have some sort of genetic disease or you may be looking at just the, under a microscope of, you know, are, do you have uh, the, the 23 pairs of genomes or is there one, or chromosomes, is there one chromosome extra or so on? So those are uh, things that you would do under the microscope, but they don't really see the individual bases or looking at big sections. Uh, something like a microarray is, is looking a little bit more closely, but again, it's only looking at a small section. So in DNA sequencing, we're talking about reading, having resolution of those individual base pairs, but then being able to do long sections of it to be able to see how all things fit together. And when I went, uh, talked in the beginning about uh, the DNA sequence that you have a gene that, that is instruction sets for a, for a protein, um, that we would call an, an exome, but actually there's uh, instruction sets on how many. Um, there's, uh, I won't go into all the biology here, but, but this slide here, um, what we're looking at is one section of the genome, and there's, there's an individual part to make the proteins, but then there's other parts. There's this beginning instruction and an in, end instruction. There's parts in between that people thought, well, it doesn't make a protein, so it's not really important. But now they're finding out when, as they are able to read these sections, that there, it's actually all, uh, much more is important than just this initial um, exome. And when you have repeating structures, so CGG is an interesting one. If um, for um, this one disease here, this fragile X uh, type of disease, in a normal, in a typical person, you would have 50 copies of CGG. In someone who has uh, fragile X syndrome, they'll have about 200 copies of CGG right here in the beginning of this, of this sequence here. Um, and then there are people that have somewhere around 50 copies. So there's more than a normal, typical person, but not as much as, as someone who's diagnosed with fragile X. What's interesting there is that um, they may not have symptoms, noticeable symptoms early in life, but then later in life, they'll start to d develop symptoms. And they won't know why, you know, what happened to them, what, what kind of disease do they have. And it turns out that they're starting to understand that these are genetic things. And so um, there's actually a, a, a huge number of people that have what's called a, a rare disease. And you can say, well, how can a huge number of people have a rare disease? Well, it turns out there's lots of rare diseases. So a rare disease, something that maybe one in only 10,000 people have. But there are so many of these rare diseases that the chances are that a, a large fraction of the population has a rare disease. And the, the challenge for the healthcare folks is that the rare diseases will have typical sim, uh, similar symptoms, but different um, treatment plans. And so uh, what can happen is that you have present with some symptoms and the doctor will say, well, it could be one of these hundred of diseases and we just have to go through them one by one to test because we can't sequence the whole genome at once. And so it can be very frustrating for the patient to have to go through and wait and say, okay, well, which one do we test first? Usually they like to test the most lethal one first. Um, and to, until they finally come through with a diagnosis. And so being able to sequence the whole genome and map out these rare diseases will help um, a lot of patients in getting a, a proper diagnosis more quickly. Um, and so you'll see that here, this is uh, work that's recent. There's a, now a company here, the SolveRD, that's trying to, to go after this. Um, uh, you see a lot of activity in China in building out these genomes, these ones that took for 10 years now. Here these guys want to go after uh, sequencing a thousand um, patients. So uh, being able to see this level of detail has really allowed the researchers uh, to, to get information that they didn't have before. And so trying to incorporate that and understand where its impact is is, is quite interesting. <clears throat> 
So let, let me turn about now to say, how do we make that, how do we make that technology available? What are the driving forces behind or the advances that happened? So Pacific Biosciences is a small company in uh, Menlo Park, very close to Facebook in the San Francisco Bay Area. The research came out of Cornell in the year 2000. Uh, PacBio is a publicly traded company. Our first product came out um, uh, around 2010. Um, and now we have our, that was the RS. Uh, now we have the SQL that uh, Peru showed earlier. We have about 400 uh, instruments uh, worldwide. The basic idea to read the DNA is this is the biosensor here. Um, we have the our surface with an enzyme, a polymerase, that takes a single strand of DNA and will incorporate the uh, nucleotides to make a double strand. What we add on here to be able to watch this individual enzyme are the fluorescent tags, that's our transducer, um, and then this structure which we call a zero mode waveguide. It's a small metal aperture around the, uh, where the enzyme is placed so we can optically isolate just the enzyme and not the, all the other background that we see. So this is an example of one. It's best illustrated in a little movie here. You'll see in this um, movie, you'll see the DNA here with the enzyme at the bottom of the zero mode waveguide. There are four, um, this is a cell here that we'll look at. There are these four different color nucleotides. If we zoom in on this cell that has, in this case, the tens of thousands, because this was our first chip that we have. Uh, so there are tens of thousands of these cells, where, or ZMWs, where we place an enzyme in each one. And then, uh, like I said, it, what this metal structure does is isolate or reduces the optical volume to a very small uh, area or volume. Uh, so that we only see the enzyme. We illuminate from below. The light is only able to propagate a few tens of nanometers, just enough to reach the enzyme. Um, and then we have on top, we often, because of the biosensor, we have water on top, we have the enzyme, and in that water solution, we have freely diffusing nucleotides that um, the enzyme can use. It chooses the complementary pair to the base that it's holding on to, and will then do the polymerization or the, or the um, incorporation to build out the, the uh, DNA. And as it's doing that incorporation, as the enzyme is binding it, the nucleotide that's quite small is held in place. And it's held in place long enough that we can distinguish that, in, that um, immobilization or that incorporation as a real event from the DNA and not something from the background. And so what we read out are movies. So we always, so this is why this movie is nice because what we are basically doing is capturing movies of these little blinks of light that, that go on. And by reading out which color is being incorporated, we understand the underlining um, DNA. And then the challenge is to do this in parallel and massively parallel. So here on this chip here, we incorporated 100,000. On the chip where we do it integrated, we have um, over a million. Then the chips get packaged in, in uh, um, trays uh, and then put into our instrument. This just shows you that we didn't necessarily go f for, um, when we do this type of technology advancement, we don't do it all in one shot. In our initial, we started with our initial um, prototype where we were just using off-the-shelf hardware. So off-the-shelf optics, very little integrated on the chip, but we used that to get things going to make sure the chemistry was working. On our first um, release, first commercial uh, product, we, put, we started to use custom optics and more integration on the chip, and then in this um, SQL release, there's very little uh, bulk optics, and most of the optics is on the chip. So what do I mean here? This zero-mode waveguide is actually our first integration, so we have to make these some wavelength uh, uh, metal structures. Uh, it can be kind of a challenge to make, can be a challenge to make on a transparent substrate. So a lot of the silicon fabs will say, sure, we can make a small hole, you know, just give us our silicon wafer. And we said, yeah, but we need to make it on a glass wafer because we need to illuminate from below. And we 
with a microscope objective that you can um, buy. Uh, we can easily interface with these small structures, but we have a limited field of view, around 3,000 ZMWs. To be able to really scale this up, we needed to be able to, we wanted to be able to observe, like I said, hundreds of thousands of these small structures. And the custom optics was just, or the commercial off-the-shelf optics was not up to the, up to the task. So what we did was we integrated, here's our zero mode waveguide up on top where the enzyme is sitting, but we needed to um, have a more efficient way of getting the light out. So what we did was we integrated this, what we call a micromirror, it's sort of like the, the, mic the mirror that you might have in a flashlight or on your car, to get these rays that were coming out in all directions direct, more collimated to allow us to use uh, lower cost optics. And so here you can see now we're taking this light that comes out of the zero mode waveguide and relaying it onto a camera, um, and you can see a, a larger array here. The system, although we can, um, we can image much more than we could with our off-the-shelf optics, this is our instrument that was sitting underneath, is actually still very complicated. We have two lasers in here and, um, that create 100,000 little beamlets that all have to be lined up to this chip. So basically, we're making a, an optical stepper or an optical alignment tool for every customer and shipping them this very precise alignment where we have to align very precisely our chip onto our, to, uh, to the camera. And um, it's not the most user-friendly or, or uh, environmentally friendly uh, instrument. It's, it's a little bit delicate even with, um, with all this uh, uh, hardware around it. So if we wanted to scale this up, it was going to be very difficult. If we wanted to scale the number of ZMWs, it was very difficult to do it in a free space architecture. But by integrating the, bring this camera, which uh, here's one of the cameras sitting up here, um, by bringing that camera to integrate it onto the, to, with the zero mode waveguide, with the biology, uh, we pass the alignment problem, instead of doing it at the customer site, we now do it in the fab. So Celtera already has the steppers to do the alignment. We build now, um, starting with the image, CMOS image sensors, we build all this technology up to, uh, up to the zero mode waveguide in an integrated wafer scale. And that allows us not only to um, lower the cost of the instrument, but also improve the performance quite a bit. So, if we just look at from the RS, this bulk free space optics, to what we have here in our um, current instrument called SQL, uh, we had a, a 7x improvement in the number of ZMWs, so how many DNA sequences we could read in parallel. We also made the instrument quite a bit smaller um, and lowered the cost for, for our customers and also you know, the complexity of running these things. But really, we didn't do this overnight, right? So this is a progression of integration. And starting, one of the key things that we did was um, build up modules one at a time, test out the modules, bring in the new materials, make sure that, as, as um, Dr. Mayer was talking about, making sure that you understand your materials, that you have a good software design tool so that you can come up with a PDK. We obviously didn't have a PDK when we put this together, but now we do. And so going to the next level, going to coming up with a new concept, a new um, advances here is a lot more straightforward. Um, and there's also, um, we talked about, heard about testing and packaging. Those are all the different parts that have to work together. Um, but what it's allowed to do is, is, is really lower the cost of, of DNA sequencing and allow some of these advances. So I, I'm glad to see lots of folks have talked about ecosystems. Um, this is basically the ecosystem that we think about as well. Obviously, you need the, the physics and the biology to be working. You have to have um, some solid, s solid physics there to make sure your concept works. But then to bring it, and you have to have the application, right? And sometimes these are chicken and egg, egg problems, so you have to work together. But building out this middle section here with um, design tools, uh, folks like iMac, where you can come in with a maybe that's something that you draw in PowerPoint and you say, hey, this, let's build this, and they go, okay, well, PowerPoint isn't really the fab, so let's work out some of those details, and then working with, with uh, the high volume manufacturers to make it low cost. Um, this is a section that's really starting uh, to, to be interesting now that we have more of these PDK type uh, elements for biosensors. <laughs>
So I'll, hopefully uh, you'll see more of this in the future. Thank you.